This is the second panel, the one that is ostensibly at least on interpretation. And uh, we'll make of it as what we can. And we will be speaking in the following order. Ben will go first, Dick second, Larry Solom third, Larry Sager fourth, and I, David Lyons, will be fifth. And because of that, I'm going to be a rough moderator here. Um, we want to fit all of us in and still have time for discussion. OK, Ben. Thanks, David. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be a part of this conference. Professor Dworkin's newest work provides philosophical riches comparable to those which we find in his massive body of work, a corpus plainly unmatched by any other figure in law and philosophy. What remains remarkable and inspiring is the combination of depth and acumen on a range of highly abstract topics and the capacity to connect these analyses with matters of serious practical and political importance. The discussion here will ultimately examine the linkage Dworkin has forged in his work between what is essentially a metaphysical question about the status of interpretive claims and moral claims on the one hand, and a normative question about how judges ought to conduct themselves in adjudicating and interpreting challenging cases on the other. Hence my title, Meta Ethics and Hard Cases. As you will see in the course of the talk, uh, I have actually drifted a fair amount in what it's about since I wrote that first paragraph in my abstract. Okay. First, I want to set forth my understanding of the connection between a variety of pressing issues in interpretive legal theory and Dworkin's thesis that there is a right answer to legal questions even in hard cases. The easiest way to see the linkage is to see a line of thought running from Holmes and Learned Hand uh, all the way through to Justice Antonin Scalia with HLA Hart drifting around in the background. What it says is that there are many cases in which there is no right answer and judges exercise what Dworkin calls strong discretion. A variety of normative implications have been drawn from this thesis. Some have inferred, for example, that the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education was legislating, not applying law, and ought to have avoided doing so because it displaced more politically accountable entities or branches. Scalia advocates interpretive methodologies that are supposedly hard-edged so as to decrease the occasions of on which strong discretion is exercised, or at least make it plain when those occasions are upon us, in which case he uh, purportedly favors deference to other branches. In this way, weak positions on judicial review and strongly textualist or historicist methodologies are advocated. Now, Dworkin's famous arguments for the right answer thesis produce arguments against each of these positions and many others. Uh, where there is a right legal answer and the interpretive process is properly understood as a reasoned pursuit of that right legal answer, judges apl are applying the law, not legislating. Perhaps the positions in the normative theory of adjudication, such as judicial restraint and textualism, can be justified, but not by the no right answer route. Uh, now, the most important part of Dworkin's refutation of this sort of view, in my opinion, is what Dworkin now calls status skepticism as applied to hard cases. That is the view that within the domain of legal interpretation, there are cases in which there is no demonstrably superior argument from applicable legal sources, and that in such cases, no one interpretive claim is really true, however strongly a judge may feel about his or her position. Truth and objectivity do not really apply to the results of legal interpretation, although we sometimes speak as if they do. So um, th that's obviously the, the view that I see Dworkin as targeting. And actually, what I'm going to discuss now is his critique of status skepticism, not as, as to legal interpretation as such, but as to the domain of uh, moral discourse, uh, principally. Uh, but I think his, his arguments are both analogous and also, of course, in some sense, connected. Um, the concern I want to raise in my comments today is that Justice for Hedgehogs contains two quite different responses to status skepticism, one offered in part one on truth and one, another one offered on part two in interpretation. The argument in part one is, in essence, what I might call not so quiet quietism 
or confident minimalism. I have elsewhere called it coherentism. It is um, akin in some important ways to the views of Donald Davidson or John McDowell with the added reminder that there is nothing in metaphysics, semantics, or epistemology that we should take as disqualifying in any sense in, in a domain of assertion that is capable of justification and uh, reasoned argument. His principal adversary in this view is the external status skeptic. Dworkin happily agrees with the status skeptic that there are no morally charged particles or morons that cause our moral beliefs or make our moral beliefs true, but he denies that the absence of such particles or entities justifies the external status skeptic in stating for any moral sentence that he would affirm that such a sentence is not really true. Okay. Um, here is... Um, thanks. The, the gist of the position I think he's embracing in part one on truth, and I'm quoting actually from a matter of principle, because I don't think the part one position has really changed very much from that. Quote, so I have no interest in trying to compose a defense of the objectivity of my interpretive or legal or moral opinions. In fact, I think the whole issue of objectivity which so dominates contemporary theory in these areas is a kind of fake. We should stick to our knitting. We should account to ourselves for our own convictions as best we can, standing ready to abandon those that do not survive reflective inspection. We can give no sense to the idea that there is anything else we could do in deciding whether our judgments are, quote, really true, unquote. In part two on interpretation, however, Dworkin does several things that have quite a different flavor. Most importantly, he rejects minimalism as to truth. He asserts that truth is an interpretive concept. He treats the correspondence theory of truth in a robust form to be uh, at least arguably tenable, cogent, and illuminating for the discourse of natural science and rejects it for interpretation and for morality. He rejects holism for science, it seems, but not for interpretation or morality. And he invites philosophers to think about what a theory of truth could look like in these other areas. I draw these observations not from a few throwaway comments that I'm scraping together, uh, but from large, evocative, and central passages in part two. I quote, we share a vast variety of practices in which the pursuit and achievement of truth are treated as values. We do not invariably count it good to speak or even to know the truth, but it is our standard assumption that both are good. The value of truth is interwoven in these practices with a variety of other values that Bernard Williams called comprehensively the value of truthfulness. These include accuracy, responsibility, sincerity, authenticity. Truth is also interwoven with a variety of concepts, conspicuously the concept of reality, but also the concepts of belief, investigation, inquiry, assertion, and argument, and philosophical concepts including cognition, proposition, statement, and sentence. We must interpret all of these concepts together, finding conceptions of each that make sense given its relation with the others and given the standard assumptions about the values of truth and truthfulness. And then a bit later, the familiar philosophical theories of truth are, there, are actually therefore best understood as interpretations of a great network of concepts and practices taken together. Now this all comes as something of a shock to the system for three quite different and equally important reasons. First, it seems to turn against what is naturally understood to be a significant force implicit in Dworkin's coherentism and explicit in the views of many similar thinkers. The philosophical worldview of the first half of the 20th century, which led to emotivism or highly reductive theories in moral thinking, and here I'm obviously being extremely broad, um, was one that engaged a robust truth as correspondence model of truth as to natural science, and then viewed moral thinking as discredited because it failed to live up to that model. Part of the reason Quine, Sellers, and later Wittgenstein left many philosophers, including many moral philosophers, feeling quite relieved is that um, their views were often seen as puncturing the idea that a robust correspondence theory of truth, a verificationist conception of meaning, and a foundationalism and epistemology would work even for natural science. The reasons for treating uh, other areas as second-class citizens seem to evaporate. 
Second, and so Dworkin's in a funny place on that, bringing back a robust conception of truth for science. Second, the assertion that truth as an interpretive, is an interpretive concept that we ought to explore in a variety of areas, including interpretation and moral thinking. This is going off to study the qualities of wool and the shape of knitting needles. It is certainly not going back to our knitting. Third, and most importantly, the embrace of truth as correspondence for science seems to me to be the beginning of a rescue for the status skeptic, um, supposedly refuted in part one. For it suggests that there is a way that the concept of truth can be connected with the notion of being entrenched in an environment with mind-independent objects that one's internal representations are capable of matching or not matching. Um, if one took the interpretive view that this is all concepts of truth are legitimate, that all concepts of truth are legitimately employed only where the discourse is appropriately connected in this way, then that would render meaningful the external skeptic statement that moral propositions are not really true. Um, now, I'm out of time, so um, let me just cut to the chase, which should have come a bit earlier. So, um, What's particularly interesting in my view is that we can read Law's Empire and even hard cases as in a sense meeting the challenge put forward in this second view uh, in, the chap in the part of the book on interpretation. In other words, what Dworkin invites us to do is to think of theory, interpretive theories of truth that are constructive in a certain sense. And now he's saying, well, actually, the old one kind of works for science and medium-sized physical objects. But we need something different for interpretive areas and probably for morality. Now, I think you can, we can understand law's empire as offering just that kind. I think that the conception of law's integrity can be understood as an interpretive theory of truth for law, and a very good one at that. Um, and so I'm left with a few different questions. First of all, it seems to me that if one conceives of integrity that way, then it's pretty natural to describe it as, in some sense, a constructivist view. And one wonders whether his move to Kant on morality in this book can also be seen as a constructivist view. But I think there's tension between much of what's said in part one of the book and the idea that one ought to turn to a constructivist view of truth uh, for any areas, including interpretive or moral ones. Second, we're left with the question of whether he ought to have stuck with part one rather than moving to part two if there really is the tension between them. And third, and I think the biggest question, and the one that conne uh, connects with the title of my piece, is if it's really true that there are these different flavors of theories of truth, different ways of interpreting truth, um, then ought we be concerned that some of the things we naturally draw from the uh, truth as correspondence model of, of what truth is, that they will fit in the constructivist area. Uh, I think it's natural to worry that in an area where a constructivist conceptualization of truth applies, uh, there may indeed be um, problems with the right answer thesis. Thanks. Thank you.